welcome to All About Boston. I'm Seth McCoy. You are joining us tonight. My guests tonight are Preeti Rao, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Women's Political Caucus. In my second segment, John Tobin, who apparently is a BNN analyst now, which I'm going to give him um, some ribbing about. Um, we'll be here later. We're talking about, of course, the mayor's race that just uh, we narrowed it down to two candidates uh, on Tuesday, which it seems like forever ago, but it was only two days ago. Narrowed that the field down to Marty Walsh and John Connolly. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have the at-large uh, race that narrowed from 19 to 8. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So if you have questions, you can call us here at 617-708-3290. Preeti, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Seth, for having me back. I'm so excited to be here. I know. I feel like this is like a, a, a nice way to cap off the election cycle to have you, not that it's over, but to have you come back <laughs> and we're going to talk about um, the election. So MWPC supported Charlotte Gola Ritchie, yes. who finished third mm -hmm. impressively. Um, a lot of people, of course, during the campaign cycle figured um, she might not finish that high. Mm -hmm. People were pushing for her, obviously, to fit, finish in one of the top two spots. But um, my question to you is, now that we've narrowed the field down to Marty Walsh and John Connolly, mm -hmm. will MWPC be involved in any way in their campaigns moving forward? Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited to be here back again. Thank you for inviting me um, to get to talk about this. What, a, what an exciting election cycle it's been. You know, I think a lot of unexpected twists and turns and we keep things uh, very exciting and fun in Boston. Um, but, you know, to take a little bit of a step back, uh, the Mass Women's Political Caucus PAC was so proud to support Charlotte Gullerichi in her run. Um, you know, our mission uh, is to elect more women to public office here in Massachusetts and certainly now this year in Boston. Um, so we were thrilled to support her. And uh, I'm very proud that we we did a tremendous amount of work on her campaign. Um, anywhere from you know direct PAC contributions to fundraising, we trained interns and put them on the campaign. <laughs> Young women who were just excited uh, to to get to get their you know feet on the ground and working on the campaigns. We uh, knocked on doors and made phone calls. I think the last tally was uh, four thousand calls and wow. twenty thousand. Sorry, that's wrong. Four thousand door knocks and 20,000 phone calls. Wow. So, you know, just a lot of real resources on the ground for her. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, of course, we're disappointed with this outcome. This is this is not, you know, kind of what we were hoping for. Right. Um, and, uh, but I think it's important to remember how, how strongly she came in third place here. You know, yeah. just within a couple thousand votes of that second spot, yeah. she ran a tremendous campaign that highlighted issues um, that I think have been largely sort of out of the realm of conversation for a long time. Right. Um, and I think certainly as a role model, you know, Charlotte Golarucci is exactly the kind of woman and we want running for office. She's, you know, eloquent and you know has experience and is imminently qualified. So we were just we're very very proud of the work that we did on this campaign and certainly proud of her and thrilled to have supported her and just looking forward to her next steps also as she moves forward. Um, but you know, again, kind of going back to what our role will be um, now moving forward with the, our two wonderful candidates that that do remain and are moving forward into the general. Um, you know, and kind of looking back at our mission, which is certainly of course to support women right. candidates. And um, neither of them are women. And no, it turns. <laughs> Out. Neither of them are, in fact, women. Um, and so I think, you know, as we move forward, what I find to be exciting mm -hmm. um, and sort of comforting in a way is that uh, as we look at the the field, um, even though they're two men, we're seeing how much impact women are having right. as candidates, as voters, as constituents. And so moving forward, I think it's going to be really important to have these two candidates speak to issues that impact women. You know, women are here working in Boston, raising families in Boston, you know, taking care of uh, elderly, you know, their elderly parents in Boston. There are right. all of these issues that women are facing every day. And so moving forward, I hope that both of these candidates will be speaking to these issues, and I think that will be happening. Um, certainly, we would be excited to be part of that and playing a role in, in that way. Um, but we are all also moving forward and looking really forward to electing some women who are running for the Boston City Council seats. <laughs> exactly, so, because there are a lot of women. There are a lot. And you know, that's something I wanted to talk about too. Um, when people were announcing for mayor, mm -hmm. everybody was saying, well, we need a woman to run, and then Charlotte did jump in. Were you surprised that not more women jumped into that race? And then for we'll, mayor? We, yes, for mayor. And then we'll, of course, talk about the city council races where there are several women running. You know, I think. Uh, we were just, I, I, I personally feel very, I was very excited when Charlotte got, got in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in general our mission is all about 
we kind of feel the more women, the better. You right. know, we, we sort of want women to be running for as many positions as possible. But it kind of, I feel like as soon as Charlotte announced, there was a sort of groundswell of support, people coalescing behind her, and we kind of just really hit the ground running. So we were thrilled to be able to get out early for her. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate that, that that happened, and we were thrilled to support her. But um, part of what we do is sort of look at the whole field in and of right. itself, and what is happening in Boston, mm -hmm. and how do we play a role to have an impact in sort of uh, making change. And part of that is then looking also at the at-large right. and, and Boston City Council yes. seats. And that's where I think a lot of exciting things are happening. So our PAC has actually endorsed four women mm -hmm. for the Boston City Council seats. Of course, um, City Councilor Ayanna Presley, who's up for re-election. Yep. Michelle Wu, who is uh, making great headlines. Yes, indeed. Um, and doing wonderful work. <laughs> um, Anissa Asabi-George, yes. who is also running for an at-large seat. She made it through. She's one of the top yes. So yep. all of these three candidates for at-large made it through uh, the prelim onto the general. And then we're really excited to be supporting Suzanne Lee in the District 2 seat. Right, and that's one that's going to be interesting to watch because, of course, the last time Suzanne ran against Bill Linehan, who was the current city councilor, mm -hmm. it was a very, very close race. Very close race. She came shy of, I think, 90 votes. Right. Very close. And I think, um, you know, so excited that Suzanne's getting right back up and running again. Mm -hmm. We were so proud to support her in that first run. We're going to stand by her in the second run. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say with Suzanne, you know, aside from being so qualified, uh, she's one of the most hardworking candidates I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, she's really out there knocking on doors, getting her message out. I think it's going to be a thrilling campaign. And I think as we look at this, it's, you know, it's so important. Um, to encourage women to run a second time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't win the first time. Right. In fact, statistically. Well, no, nobody really wins nobody the first really time. Wins. Unless nobody you are really, <laughs> really, really lucky. <laughs> and so it's so important. And I think oftentimes, you know, we, we go through this period of maybe feeling discouraged and maybe mm -hmm. saying, oh, can we really do this? Right. And certainly as soon as I feel like when a woman sort of, or when a woman sort of loses, there's always this conversation, can we ever break this ceiling? Will right. this ever really happen? Right. Um, and yet time and time again, we see that it's the second time when candidates get even stronger and are better and able to, to kind of really to get in. Well, yeah, it's like doing anything. I mean, if you're learning how to ride a bicycle, <laughs> the first few times you might fall you off, fall but off. you have to keep getting on yes. to see if you can finally get on the bike and keep riding. And that's really what campaigning is all about it for is. men and for women. Absolutely. And, and I think especially that's what I'm most proud of at the MWPC. You know, as soon as we get through something, we say, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. How do we help more women? How do we get back off the mat and, and get back at it again? And I think Suzanne really, uh, Suzanne Lee really epitomizes that. So right. very proud, very excited. And I think we're, I'm going to, we're coming back for those 90 votes. I'm getting those 90 votes. <laughs> exactly. But there are three other candidates for running for at-large, three other women candidates, mm -hmm. if you will. So let's talk a little bit about them. Um, I think people are excited that there are so many women to mm -hmm. choose from. Um, the way the, the votes finished, though, on Tuesday, it was Ayanna Presley, yes. Michael Flaherty, mm -hmm. Uh, Steve Murphy, Michelle Wu, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to even try to go down past the number, <laughs> past the four. <laughs> um, but how are we going to, or how are you, I should say, mm -hmm. going to try to work so Anissa um, might raise her Razor, yeah. profile a little bit um, and get maybe one mm -hmm. of those two spots, essentially, that are that are, uh, that are open. Uh, that are open. Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, what's really exciting things happen in that prelim. Mm -hmm. First of all, of course, City Council Ariana Presti topped the ticket once again. Right. Um, how exciting is that when we have, you know, a woman of color. Um, yeah. She is the first woman of color ever to serve on the Boston City Council. Oh, I just want to interrupt you real quick yeah. we, because we just put up, uh, thankfully, Hillary and David put up the numbers for... Um, the at-large total so we can see the full order. And so, as I mentioned, Diana Presley, Michael Flaherty, Steve Murphy, Michelle Wu, Marty Keough, Jeffrey Roth, Anissa Savvy-George, Jack Kelly uh, make the top eight. And then, of course, uh, just finishing, uh, unfortunately, a little too mm -hmm. um, short of votes, Catherine O'Neill and Althea Garrison. So we had a lot of women this time around. A lot of around. women. So that's what we want. Exactly. That's exactly what we want. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know part of this is when you look at those numbers, you can see our top vote getters are very clustered at the top. You know, we're looking at 16 percent, then about 15, 13, 11. So um, the rest of the candidates, sort of below those top four, there is definitely a spread, right? Yeah. So they're kind of clustered. They're sort of clearly yep. um, kind of at the top and sort of solidified the vote there. Um, so I think the important thing there is is to kind of look at both how well Ayana and 
Michelle Wu have done. Mm -hmm. um, how well they've organized, how well they've gotten their name out there. The, to, to have a lead like that is impressive and, and commendable. Right. Um, you know, but I think there is a tremendous opportunity here. Um, if you look at who came out to vote in the preliminary, um, there were a lot of communities that may not have really come out. I think that's going to change, you know, given the mayoral. I have, I have numbers you know, as, as to how many people. So a little more than 30% of registered voters actually came out on Tuesday, which is pitiful, if you ask me, yeah. because there are more than a quarter million people who did not vote. Mm -hmm. um, so if you compare it to 2009, where we had 23% of eligible voters coming out, mm -hmm. which uh, comes out to about $81,000, 81,000 people, um, it's an increase this time, mm -hmm. but it was an open yeah. race, essentially, for mayor, mm -hmm. obviously, and then we had two open seats on the at-large, just those two seats there. Um, it's pitiful to me that only 30% of registered voters came out to the polls. It's a lot lower uh, than I think I would have want, would have hoped for. Um, and I, you know, I, I sort of am out with my team knocking on doors and making these phone calls for the caucus right. uh, throughout the summer. Um, and uh, and I remember knocking on a lot of doors, and the response that we got from a lot of people was, "There's just too many candidates." I'm going right. to wait. I heard that I so heard that many times. Too. And it was so shocking to me, Seth, because I was sitting there thinking, why would you wait? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I know. It's your choice. Now's your time. You um, and so I think what we're going to see, of course, then is in the general, you're going to see a lot more people coming out and right. voting. You're going to see new demographics of people coming out and voting. I'm not sure, you know, if you look at the breakdowns of numbers, the communities of color didn't really come out and right. in the numbers that were really anticipated. And I think that's really going to change. So um, when you look at the breakdown of the, so the top vote getters um, for the at-large seats, while they have a significant lead, I think that when you move into the general, given Given that I think the demographics of voters are going to change, there is ample opportunity right. um, for somebody to really make a place. And when you look at Anissa George's campaign, she's done a tremendous job. This is one of the best campaigns I've seen. You know, she's coming out of Dorchester. She is has a, such a great message. She's a teacher from East Boston. Right. She is a mother of four boys, triplet sons. Yes. I mean, really, and and a small business owner. Right. And so when you look at her campaign and her message, I think it'll resonate with the voters. Um, and I think this is really about the ground game. You got to right. get organized. You got to get out the vote. Um, and and I. I think for the top ticket, uh, sort of top tiered candidates on this list, they can't take anything for granted. Well, know? and I do want to point out that Ayana actually had more votes alone than both Marty and John had mm -hmm. individually, mm -hmm. which is amazing. It's amazing. So it's amazing. I'm wondering if um, I know there was a lot of talk about Ayana running for mayor. Possibly <laughs> she did not, not obviously choose to, <laughs> she do didn't that, choose to do that. But looking at that, mm -hmm. those numbers, I wonder how different they would have been or if it would have been the same for her if she had put her name in for mayor. Yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard question. I'm not asking, Seth, I'm not asking you to speculate, but I just think well, it's interesting. In, in, my, in my dreams, you know, this, know. Is, this is what I hope for, obviously. Um, no, I think, you know, with Ayana, I just, as we look at the number of women who are running, I am so encouraged, right? Um, Ayana is currently the only woman on our Boston City right. Council. She is the first woman of color ever to serve in uh, its over 100-year history. Yeah. In and of itself, it's historic. But if you look at what she has done, Right. That's where it gets really incredible. She has changed the way we're talking about city government. Mm -hmm. She ran on a platform of women and girls and communities and families, healthy families, yeah. and she has done such tremendous work that is resonating throughout the city. And I think that's what that vote reflects. Right. She ran on a record and people resonated with that record and that's what's exciting. Even more so than that, she's a role model for all of these other women who are now running. Right. If this is what Ayana can do, think of what would happen if we have Michelle and Anissa and so many other women there working together. We're going to change the dialogue. We're going right. to change the discourse, and that's what we ultimately want. And one thing that could change, too, is um, in January, the city council votes for a council president. Mm -hmm. So perhaps Ayanna will go for that, and then she would be the council president, which obviously brings another level of esteem on her resume and also for, for women looking out. Not that she mm -hmm. would be the first woman to serve as council president, but I think it would definitely be something that would be noteworthy for all women to pay attention something to. Something to think about. Exactly. <laughs> You'll have to call her after this. <laughs> I'll get her right on the phone. Exactly. So do you think it's possible, though, and when do you see it happening that a mm -hmm. woman will successfully run for mayor of Boston? I think I think we're on the cusp. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you look at Charlotte's race, here's what's important to remember. Um, there always has to be somebody first. Mm -hmm. And what she has done, which is remarkable, is laid the path for another woman to come up behind her. Right. And it will be easier. And it will be um, sort of the path is sort of more clear because of what she's done. Right. She spoke so beautifully at her um, rally on election night, and I've just been resonating her words in my mind. She said, 
um, together we open the door and it's going to be up to somebody else to walk through it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what she has done. And it's, it's remarkable and I'm so grateful to her for it. Um, she showed that a woman and a woman of color can be a credible candidate. Right. She, can be, she is imminently qualified. She showed that a woman and a woman of color can be imminently qualified to run for mayor of Boston. Mm -hmm. She proved that not only can she be credible and qualified and viable, but that she can run a competitive campaign that came just within a couple thousand votes shy of that second spot. Well, she had a you lot know? of a, a lot of feedback from people saying that she didn't really have a message. Mm -hmm. So, what was your take on when you're reading, you know, different newspaper articles mm -hmm. or hearing people say, "Well, what is Charlotte's mm -hmm. message? What is she trying to do?" Um, a lot of people didn't think she had a clear message. Yeah, I disagree with that. I really do. I think she did have a very clear message. You know, she was running on her track record mm -hmm. of actually building community and in making change in Boston. Mm -hmm. She was running on a track record of raising a family here in Boston, putting her daughters through the public school system, you know, and 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 sort of running on this record of actually having served as a state rep here, right. you know, and actually having worked in government at every level, local, state, federal. Mm -hmm. I, I when I hear this sort of, she never had a message, um, I find that to be, just, just to be blatantly, it wasn't correct. I never felt that way. Right. And I think she did have a message. And I think oftentimes women who run, they get sort of constantly sort of pushed, pushed back <laughs> against this, you know? Right. And it happens. It happens at every level. And then, like I say, there always needs to be somebody to go first. Mm -hmm. But what will happen now is a second woman who will come behind her you know, those questions, I think, may not come up in the same way. So is that something that you... Um and MWPC, are you sitting back and looking at the landscape of women mm -hmm. in Boston and thinking, okay, who could we maybe groom and mm -hmm. prepare for four years from now or eight years from mm -hmm. now? Absolutely, it's something that's always in the back of our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, part of what we do is, of course, on the recruitment side in, in multiple ways. We do, um, we have young professionals programs and campaign training programs mm -hmm. and internship programs where we're just trying to bring in women um, to start sort of getting them groomed and acclimated and active in, in politics. Um, and then the other piece is, of course, looking at women who are currently active, who could either be moved up or who could be pulled in, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about that very strategically. Um, but for today, I have to tell you, we're looking at these these four women we've got and doing everything that we can to get them elected. Yeah, and I have to say, uh, I think whoever becomes the, the next mayor, whether it's John Conley or Marty Walsh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes because coming in after Mayor Menino is going to be very difficult. And also, I think that, and I've said this all along, and I could be wrong, although I should probably put money on it to just see if I'm right. I almost feel that whoever becomes mayor is going to be a rebound mayor, if you will. <laughs> and then in four years, there's going to be people well, who are going to run, and that person will mm -hmm. slowly walk away, and there'll be another new mayor in four years. You know, you, I, you might be right about that. I mean, I think, I, I feel so much when I, when I sit here and as we're thinking about this new Boston, this change that we're on, mm -hmm. uh, sort of on the cusp of, which is so exciting. This is, this is what I live for. Yeah. Um, it's so important to look back and, and see how far we've come. And that's so due to Mayor Menino. You right. know, what he has done for the city, the revitalization of this city, the development of the city, mm -hmm. um, and especially where, I, where I'm sitting, his work to empower and advance women mm -hmm. um, and to create a better living conditions for women in the city. It's just unparalleled. And so we're just so grateful to him. And I think we'll continue to be. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to have to be the person <laughs> I know, right? Shoes. Big but, shoes to fill. Very but, big shoes. Um, but, you know, I think I, with new ideas and change always comes this uh, longing mm -hmm. for, for, for what you know right. and what you're used to. And right. I think we are at a place where we need to take that leap. Um, right. We need to push these candidates who are remaining to talk to us about their vision for Boston, mm -hmm. the issues that matter to us. Now right. is the time yeah. to make sure they're speaking it to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have to take this leap together as a community and as a city. What um, do you think to are the top forward. issues for the city moving forward? You know, I think certainly uh, you can see John Connolly is obviously talking about education, and this yeah. is something that everyone has been focusing on. He's made it a cornerstone of his campaign. I think we're going to see that moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Walsh, of course, has been talking about working class um, sort of experiences and uh, challenges. He's been talking about labor. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to obviously see that continuation. Yeah. Um, I think we sort of kind of hovered around issues around public safety. I think that's going to be a cornerstone issue on the campaign. I think we're going to he hear more people talking about that. And certainly as a young woman in Boston, that's something that I think about yeah. you know, every I mean, day. Well, especially after reading the paper today and there, there were four mm -hmm. attacks in the Back Bay 
between mm -hmm. the hours of, I think, like 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. this morning. I mean, that's crazy. It, it's And it it's almost seems to be like these stories are coming up more and more every right. day. Um, and, and if we want to be retaining and attracting young women talent and keeping them in the mm -hmm. city, which is so critical, we need to right. be doing this, Public safety is something we're going to really need to be talking right. about in a variety of contexts, obviously. Exactly. Um, that's one of them. And then, of course, I think jobs in the economy, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, we're looking at sort of development and the innovation economy and all of these um, issues that I think we've kind of been bouncing around, perhaps. Right. I think we're going to see more depth um, and delving into them. And, and I think it's important to have those discussions. And I think mm -hmm. both with the two candidates we have remaining, um, we're going to see, I think, a very... Um, comprehensive and a very thoughtful conversation mm -hmm. and I think that's that's what I'm excited about right I want to jump a little bit away from city politics and talk briefly about um, statewide politics sure. and of course <laughs> I'm going into the whole issue of the governor's race yes. so we have Steve Grossman mm -hmm. Martha Coakley mm -hmm. um, how will you we have some others too of course mm -hmm. but how will you um, navigate those waters obviously the goal of mwpc is to promote women mm -hmm. so are you automatically with martha from the start so actually there are two women oh there's oh, and martha and julia and Kayan, Julie, yes I, who is running and uh, is, is is doing great work and yes. i have heard of wonderful things about her yep. and then uh, martha coakley who of course you know we we've been proud to support her in the past mm -hmm. um the way that the mwpc uh, approaches these races is um we are open to all women who are running. Mm -hmm. uh, again, our main mission is to have more women run. That's yeah. what we're excited about. Right. Um, we're nonpartisan, so again, we'll look at women across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, we are staunchly pro-choice, so there, there is that <laughs> caveat in there. Um, but what we do is, uh, as soon as a seat opens up and women start to jump in, yeah. um, we have a very comprehensive uh, vetting process. So we bring, um, we have a questionnaire where we vet all of our candidates on a variety of issues that we believe are important to women. Mm -hmm. uh, we invite any woman in, in the race for any seat yeah. to come speak to us and then we interview our candidates and we have a bipartisan pack board that takes a vote and releases an endorsement and from there then we provide resources so um, you know from where I'm sitting I just I feel like Seth all of the work that you know brilliant women who have come before me have been doing for 20 years now getting women to run and saying this is important and being involved in politics mm -hmm. look at where we are now right we exactly have four women running for the boston city council for the first time we can take four seats on right. a 13 person council yep. we had a woman running for mayor we've got two women running for governor yep. we've got two women running for congress yep. it's just I <laughs> we mean, might this have is it. we might have women running for our treasurer we might have women running for Secret secretary of state yep. uh attorney general you never know so I Opening feel like the doors. A, a dam has broken in a certain <laughs> way. You know, it's just it's just so thrilling to me. And this is what I've been waiting for for years, mm -hmm. and it's here, and I just couldn't be more more excited. And I think when you have more women, you're having um, just dialogue and discourse at a level that we haven't seen before. Right. And I, I'm just really looking forward to it. Me too, and I want to thank you so much for being here today to talk about all of these things thank and you. to, of course, uh, promote MWPC. It's uh, an important organization for all women here in Massachusetts. So Thank thanks you. so much for being here. And we are going to take a quick break and then we're going to have John Tobin here right in that chair. So we'll be right back. Stay tuned. And welcome back to All About Boston. I'm Seth McCoy. Joining me now is BNN analyst John Tobin. If you have a question for us, you can call in at 617-708-3290. We're of course talking about the election from Tuesday and uh, what we're going to anticipate moving forward and I just I have to crack up about the BNN analyst part I almost couldn't say it with a straight face but you are I think I almost you didn't are. have a straight face with you saying it <laughs> makes two of us I think well you are I mean you're always here you come on my show a lot and of course you come on Joe Heisler's show all the time so I, I think love that's being an, here this I is how I get elected I, to the city council by using this uh, form you don't when you're running for office and you don't have any money and uh, it's to get your message out yeah, local cable is know, the way to go I'm glad you brought that up because I'm gonna say I was very happy that all of the at-large candidates that we invited on, um, which was all 19, showed up and I interviewed them. The mayoral candidates, some of them, not so much. So hopefully moving forward, I'll be able a to get- A wasted opportunity, I, I say. That's what I say. I'm like, this but is free airtime. It's like a good opportunity to get your message out, especially when there were so many people running. What better forum than a one-on-one -on -one interview. And with remote control, I have 200 cable channels, but I'm still surfing around right. looking for things. So. Exactly, exactly. So hopefully we'll have uh, Marty Walsh and John Conley coming in uh, in the next six weeks before the November 5th election. Can you believe, first of all, that uh, I feel like the election seems so far away, even though it was just two days ago, and then looking ahead, I feel like November 5th will be here 
before you know it. That's going to be here quick. It was a relatively short campaign, though. Yeah. I mean, the mayor ha having announced uh, pretty much in late March, mm -hmm. and by the time the candidates who have to give kind of the kind of the grieving period for the mayor to let him do his thing and be with his family and make his announcement, and by the time they get on track, I mean, in Charlotte, I think Charlotte didn't announce until May first. Right. So as far as mayoral campaigns go, it's almost like a special election in right. a lot of ways in, ter in terms of the condensed uh, time frame. Except for John Conley and Charles Clemens, who announced before the mayor had uh, made it public that he was not going to be seeking re-election. And I would say that uh, obviously John was the beneficiary of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although were you surprised that, you know, a lot of people were talking that John was going to come in first place, Marty was going to be in second, um, and it actually flipped. So mm -hmm. were you surprised that Marty came in ahead of John, given that John had so much more time? Somewhat. I mean, all the polling that had been done uh, throughout the, when it started, the polling, the numbers started coming out back in July and August, yeah. uh, had consistently John at the top. Uh, but I think that also uh, speaks to, uh, Marty put an incredible ground game out mm -hmm. there uh, on, on Tuesday, and leading up to Tuesday. Uh, it was, I've said it, it was not unusual to drive around the streets of Boston, in particular where I live in West Roxbury, to see men and women in work boots who have clearly worked during the day, right. uh, who were out with clipboards uh, out there knocking for, for Marty Wall. So he put a terrific ground game together. Mm -hmm. Deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he does have a tremendous team. John has a tremendous team as yep. well. So it'll be interesting to see uh, as we move forward the candidates that did not make it to the final to uh, how they might line up behind whichever candidate. Do you have any predictions that you care to share? You would you would think, uh, without any inside information, you would think that, uh, you know, John, a, a lot of people, that were, how many councils ran, six or seven? Yeah. Uh, you would think a lot of John's colleagues would probably uh, uh, line up with him. Uh, there could be some surprises. You would think that Dan Conley's votes, uh, being a neighbor of John's and West Roxbury, and John and Dan are, you know, were, are close. Um, that maybe naturally, just geographically, mm -hmm. uh, that some uh, that a lot of Dan's votes, or perhaps a lot of Robbie's votes, uh, uh, would um, would go to John just on a geographic basis. Right. But then you have you know Marty, who's got Charlotte Colarichi, who. There's a kind of a brotherhood, sisterhood there with, she served in the legislature and their mm -hmm. neighbors, you know, from Dorchester and uh, John Barros is in that area too, mm -hmm. Bill Walzek's in that yep. area. So the real, uh, the battleground is the middle of the city and it's not just people of color, it's just the middle of the city. You've right. got John from southwest part of the city and you've got Marty up in, up in the north and um, that's where the real battleground's going to be. I think the, the real keys, I think the casino issue is kind of off the table now. Mm -hmm. uh, the real, seeing that John and Marty both agree with it, mm -hmm. um, you know, the real issue I think is going to be this, the, both uh, candidates are going to have to identify, I believe, a pretty short list of who their candidates will be for pretty three, three significant positions right. and, and police superintendent, school superintendent, uh, and head of the BRA. Right. Uh, and I don't know that saying we're going to have a nationwide search and the best qualified candidate is going to cut it. I think people are going to want specifics. I think you're right, and I think the spotlight is definitely going to be more focused in on what each of them are saying. Today, even there was news about uh, John Conley wants the People's Pledge to be signed. This is something that he didn't want initially. Now he wants it. Marty, on the other hand, wanted it before. Now he doesn't. So these are the things that we're going to see moving forward. What are you, what's your thought just on that alone? Uh, it's a natural, the ebb and flow of a campaign, <laughs> exactly. you know, it's just the things that you, ha you have to do, you have to pivot, uh, you have to be tactful, I mean, a, a 12 person race where they're just kind of going around in this nomadic tribe around, right. the, around the city going to four into debates and, you know, the focus is now squarely on two people and the, and the focus uh, in the spotlight intensifies yeah. uh, on each in terms of backgrounds and um, uh, legislative records, mm -hmm. uh, it's all going to come to the fore, there's just not enough time or perhaps even interest to, uh, you know, to do that with 12 candidates. Now when you boil it down to two, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to really intensify. And you're going to see people uh, perhaps not flip-flop, per se, but uh, pivot and be tactful about the positions based on who their opponent is. Right. What do you think the campaigns are going to focus on for both Marty and for John moving forward? Uh, again, I think it's those three key positions. I think gonna be, you know, it, with with John, it's his his issue is, uh, is, is education. He's got a lot of, of, of mm -hmm. issues that he's he concerned about, but he wants to be the education mayor. Right. So I, I think people are going to want to know. Do you think know. that's a losing battle, though? I mean, Mayor Menino campaigned on fixing Boston Public Schools. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, we were not able to get to that finish line where I'm sure the mayor wanted to be, where people in the city wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's dangerous for John to just say, I want to be the education mayor? Because 
let's be real, he's going to come in if he's elected, there's a transition, then you've got to sort of set up your, your team that's not already in right. place before you get in because, of, of course, he's got people in mind where he wants them to go. But once you get in the building, he's still going to have to think, okay, well, now I'm going to do this and that and the other thing. So you might lose a full year before your administration is up and fully running, and then you only have really two years sure. of work to do before you're running for re-election. The old adage, uh, you're never as popular as the day you were elected. Right. Uh, it starts to go downhill a little bit <laughs> after that. And you have, you have people who, are, who campaign for you, who are perhaps looking for positions in City Hall. Uh, and you also have people who have been running city business. A lot of them have been there through the, the whole right. Menino uh, administration. There are just basic things that make the city tick that I think a lot of us take for granted. Right. There's actually a lot of work and a lot of institutional knowledge in that building. Yeah. And people who well, uh, make things go. Think about, you know, a couple weeks from now, the Rosendale Day Parade. Who runs that? Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can you just... So I, there, there are things... It, it's, I think people... Whomever it, it comes out victorious on November 5th, whether it's, uh, whether it's John or, or Marty, uh, has an enormous challenge ahead of them. Mm -hmm. People have got to be patient. Yep. And they've been, you know, I think people are, are, are in a sense of complacency. The city's in a good place. People feel comfortable with Mayor Menino. Really? You think they're complacent? Only 30% of eligible voters came I, out to vote. I, I must be honest. I thought it was disgraceful. It uh, is. I, I, I really do. I, I, yeah. I've heard every, you know, you hear these things about, about elections. Well, we don't have enough choices. Well, there were, there were 12 people running. Right. There were all kinds of different backgrounds and varieties right. to choose from. Then you hear, we want campaigns to be civil and no mudslinging. This was the most civil race uh, yeah. since my race for fourth grade president at, uh, <laughs> at, at, at St. Gregory's in Dorchester. I mean, this is, so we had a civil race, we had a race with a lot of variety, and yet the turnout was, was that. Yep. Uh, the polls were open for 13 hours. Yeah. There is, I mean. Well, and then you had people who were saying, I can't make a decision because there are too many people. So on one hand, people are saying there's not enough people to choose from, and then when we have enough people, they're just not getting out there, yeah. which is so frustrating. Dunkin' Donuts has 25 different varieties of donuts and right. uh, 18 different coffee flavors. There's a line out the door to get in there. Exactly. I, mean, I wish people treated the polls the same way. And you know, the interesting part is that people wait in, have waited in line to vote for, for president, for President Obama. Yeah. They waited in, online to, uh, to vote for, for governor, for Governor Patrick. Yeah. With all due respect, the, you know, the governor and, and the president are not going to return your phone call. Right. Uh, you may, you'll see the governor in the neighborhoods, but occasionally you see the, the President Obama in the neighborhood, you're not going to get close to him. Right. The mayor uh, in your city councils are the ones who are out there every single day. They shop in the same grocery stores you do. Yep. The kids play the same playgrounds. I mean, they're, they're walking around, they're jogging, they're running around. You see them everywhere. Well, and you know that as a former city councilor, you, I'm sure you were at Roach Brothers or out to dinner, and people would come up to you all the time. And, you know, it's not always, hey, nice to see you. It's, hey, <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> hey, I have this issue. Can you help me? Yeah, there's not a lot of people looking at pick up your dinner tab. I mean, right. it's sort of fun. And it's not, and I would be preface this by saying, I, you're not working in a coal mine. Right. Uh, but it is a time element. And it's, a, it's a big one. And when people, when you're out to eat, it's, it's, and you're out just trying to do your everyday business, you're on the clock. It's a, but I think everybody who's in the business who has been in for a period of time, maybe it's a, a, a shock to people who run for the first time right. or get elected. It takes a little while to get acclimated to that. But John and Marty are no strangers to this. Right, I mean, right. But it will, whoever is elected, it will intensify, uh, not just over the next six weeks, but if you get elected, uh, uh, even more so. Yeah. We had a lot of candidates of color in this race mm -hmm. um, for mayor. Um, some people have said because a candidate of color did not make it to the final, Boston isn't really progressive. Do you buy into that? <laughs> I, I, I just think that's uh, so way off the mark. I mean, look at my boss at Northeastern uh, is a man named Ralph Martin. Uh, who, <laughs> Who's a fantastic, fantastic man, by the way. He's terrific, yeah. and, uh, and, and I hope you're watching, Ralph. And so, uh, and, but he, got, he, he was elected. Can, can we convince him to run again? <laughs> so he was the DA, if, if people are unfamiliar with Ralph Martin, he was the DA, uh, and a tremendous man all around. African-American and, African man from Brooklyn, uh, of all places, and yes. came in. And, uh, and people you know, actually floated his name for mayor. Sure, he was. He was. I mean, his name has been floated for a, for a long time, and, and he'd be a great one if he ever decided to do it. But I think he's in a place where he's comfortable. Uh, you know, he's, he's got his, his kids and his mm -hmm. you know and his job at Northeastern, and before that, a, a successful career. Um, but I mean, at you know, Ralph won in, in countywide in 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, sheriff Cabral, a woman of color, uh, mm -hmm. has won uh, sheriff uh, a couple of times now. Uh, well, before she left yeah. to become state uh, public safety director, uh, Governor Patrick. Well, I mean, just look at the young class now of uh, of uh, black and Latino Latina 
uh, state representatives and state mm -hmm. senators. For years, we didn't have that in the city. Right. I think Governor Patrick's election and certainly President Obama's election have inspired a whole class of people yeah. of color, a young people of color, to run for office, and that's a great thing. Well, and we just had Linda Dorsina Forey, who was very successful in her bid to be moved from a state rep to a state senator, and that that district encompasses South Boston, which of course people uh, right. know is historically not necessarily. Uh, friendly to uh, people of color. Sure. I think, you know, keep in mind, when, when Governor Patrick ran for for, uh, for governor, there were people who couldn't pronounce his first name. Right. Or they were or calling, they him, they were calling him Patrick Duvall. Yeah. They thought they would get him confused with, you know, uh, with Tim Murray. They were calling him <laughs> Tim Patrick and Petter Tim. And, yeah. Uh, but the governor had a year and a half to introduce himself to the voters. Right. Because of the condensed time frame, I think that's what really hurt. It took everybody by surprise. Yeah. It took everybody by surprise. Uh, John had already been out there. Now, keep in mind, John is a citywide councillor. <laughs> so Marty has, has been name. a state representative, very well known mm -hmm. uh, since 1997. Uh, even though he just has that district, he's been very helpful over the years to, to Senator Hart and his efforts, mm -hmm. uh, to Congressman Lynch. Uh, and he was head of the Boston building trades. Right. So he's got a city, you know, kind of that base of, you know, of labor there that's mm -hmm. there. He's also huge in the recovery community. Yep. And he's helped a lot of people, not just in his district, but around the city. And right. people remember that and are grateful to him, to him for that. And they were both the two well most funded. Mm -hmm. I think a person that was pointed out in Yvonne Abraham's article to a person, you know, one of the winners out of the losing class this year is a guy named John Barrows. Oh, fantastic, fantastic candidate. Now, you mean to tell me if John Barrows didn't have more than four months to introduce himself to the voters and get them to come on, that yeah. he wouldn't have done a whole lot better in this race? Yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's someone to, to look out for. I just think it's a... There's just not enough time of the day to do what you want to do, to get your introduction, to get those people to the polls. It's a, it's a big effort, uh, and clearly the people who are incumbents and have those natural bases are going to benefit. And I just want to mention, John Barrows finished sixth place right behind Felix Arroyo, which, you know, Felix being an at-large city councilor has that citywide recognition. Uh, John Barrows, not a name mm -hmm. well-known across the city, but yet he did really, really well. Yeah, and, and there's another guy, Felix Arroyo. He's, yeah. People got to keep him, he's 34 years old. He's been on the council for four years. Yep. I, I think if Felix wants an, another future in elected office, I think there's going to be... You think he'll come back and run for something? I think, I think it's in his DNA. Yes. I, think be, I think it's just, uh, that's what he grew up in. That's the household yeah. he grew up in. He relishes the job as a counselor. I, hey, you know, I, I, some people say he should have waited his turn. The political caste system, the timing is over. That, right. that, that, and thank, thankfully it's over. He took a shot. He ran hard. He's a young guy. He'll be back. Well, yeah, and you brought up a, a good point. There was some talk during the campaign season that some candidates, John Barris, for example, should step aside so that Charlotte could really focus and get a lot of those votes that people thought uh, would maybe go to John Barris or Charles Yancey or Charles Clemens. Um, is that something that you think should be happening? Um, obviously, by your reaction right now, shaking your head, it's, it's not. I just wish people would run their races and be conservative themselves. Right. Run your organization, and it shouldn't even matter to anybody who else is in the race. Right. I mean, should should Dan Conley have gotten out of the race because John Conley is a neighbor from West Roxbury was in it, or vice right. versa? Or should Robbie Casalvo not get into it because there were all these people bunched up in southwest Boston? Right. Um, I just really, I think it's less an issue about race than it is sometimes about geography. Yep. And people are going for the same amount of votes in a condensed area. I mean, having run uh, for several competitive district city council races, it puts people, when you're going after the same small group of people in an area, you, get, you try and grab them, but then you're also trying to burrow into other communities where right. you're not as well known and take votes from other people. It's hard. Right, but, but that's part of the, the nature of the beast. And, you know, we live in a democracy. It's not, okay, if I'm going to run, and but you and I are neighbors, I'm not going to knock on your door and say, sorry, John, you've already done your... Right. Your time. It's my turn. So step aside. Like it's like on the city council at large when I uh, laugh when they put together these slates and these and and right. they, it, it only becomes disastrous. Right. Just I just people who I think are the most successful are the ones who just pay attention, mind their own knitting, yep. and pay attention to their race and put the blinders on. What other people do is what other people do, but I'm going to run my race. I right. have my people, and I'm going to get my people to polls and just let other people fend for themselves. And that's the way it ought to be. Well, and I think Campaign 101 is you never mention the other person, your, any of your challengers by name. You focus on what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And I think, you know, going back to the civilities, uh, people want to, they want to hear from you. Uh, they want to know your past achievements, what, you, what your vision is, what your plan right. is. They're not really interested in you tearing apart the other person. Right. Uh, if they're an educated voter, 
they know the story, they, yep. and they're going to make up their mind. But I think they want to hear from you. They want to be able to relate to you. Right. Uh, and if you're going to sit there, you know, tearing someone down, probably, I think people want to go to want to vote for somebody that they want to go out and have a, a soft drink or a beer with. <laughs> exactly. It's, you know, that's someone they're comfortable with, someone they can relate to, but someone also that is a little bit elevated they can look up to a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. We also had um, a really interesting at-large race. We mm -hmm. had 19 candidates. Um, were you surprised at how any of those uh, candidates finished? Uh, no, I, 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 Michael Flaherty, look, he was a city council president. He got 42% of the vote for mayor. I think clearly uh, Michael redoubled his efforts this time. He yeah. had run for council a couple years ago. And I, I don't really, he probably he just, uh, a hangover effect from running for mayor, and, <laughs> and it's just tough. And just sometimes the dynamics of the races and who's running and, you know, right. the timing uh, is a little bit off. Uh, but Michael acquitted himself very, very well. Mm -hmm. Ianna Presley obviously maintained that uh, top yep. billing. Michelle Wu was someone. Now, there's, a, there's an example. Now, if Michelle Wu got into the race in March, would she have come in, uh, you know, right. uh, fourth in this race? Probably not. But she, Michelle was out there this time last year yes. making her introduction to the voters. People had already known her from the Elizabeth Warren campaign. She had worked in City Hall. But still, the greater electorate didn't know she was, and she did really well. The thing that was uh, surprised me, there's some other you know, first-time candidates in there, you know, Marty Keough, Jack yep. Kelly. Um, Catherine O'Neill. Catherine O'Neill, who I think just came a little bit out yep, of the, of the she money. Was, uh, yeah, ninth place. Ramon, a, Ramon yeah. Soto, yeah. Um, a great guy, from, uh, and, and Ramon has a, has a wonderful future. Yep. The thing that was, you know, Pretty telling to me was the significant dropout drop off uh, between uh, you know the, yeah the top four yeah and then the drop off once you get to five six seven eight nine right so, so, eight, seven eight yeah. yeah so Michelle came in a little over twenty nine thousand votes and then the next drop down to Marty Keough was fifteen thousand seven hundred thirty four votes so that is a significant drop do you think we'll see any change in the order here something significant is going to happen. I mean, clearly, I, I would hope and expect, and, and general elections always draw out more voters. Mm -hmm. How many more that's going to be? Is it 20,000? Is it 25,000? I'd like to think it's 100,000, but that's wishful thinking, I suppose. But um, it's all going to depend on the, in, the, I think the intensity of, or lack thereof <laughs> of the mayor's race. Yep. And I think it will be intense. I think eventually yeah. we'll start to. Well, we're already starting to see it. You're starting to see it already, and, and it will develop will pique people's interest and perhaps bring out more mm -hmm. uh, more voter interest and more turnout. And you also have people who are, you know, you have the you know, incumbent, Councilor Murphy and Councilor Presley, Michael Flaherty, mm -hmm. they know how to turn votes out. Right. Clearly Michelle Wu uh, learned a lot by working on campaigns right. and she turned out the vote as well. Yeah, exactly. But Marty knows how to turn out the vote too. Right. And, and Jack has worked on campaigns and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and some other folks in there, they're, not, they're no strangers to this. Right. So, you don't, you don't know, but that's a lot of ground to make up. So there was a lot of talk, though, about this this new Boston, uh, an opportunity to bring new blood onto the city council in the at-large uh, seats. Michael Flaherty, though, as we mentioned, he has been there before. Were you surprised at that? That, um, And you did talk a little bit about this moments ago, but that he would do so well um, given the fact that he's already been there, so there might have been a push from other people to say, okay, well, Michael Flaherty has been there before. I like these four other people, so I'll just give them my vote this time. Well, I, Michael, I mean, I, I always joke around, but it's half the truth. Michael's got more first cousins than anybody who's ever run for elected office in Boston. He's got right. a family network that goes out around the city. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really, it's really <laughs> something else. Uh, and he's also, Michael, Michael knows how to do this stuff. I mean, he grew up in a household. I mean, he, Michael, Michael, you know, when I, I remember, that we, we ran together for the first time in 95. I ran district, Michael ran at large. Michael came in the money, I think, in the in the prelim, and then dropped, I think, maybe to sixth or seventh in the final ninety-five. Mm -hmm. um, but he he was a, one of the best retail campaigners that I had ever had ever witnessed. Mm -hmm. I actually learned a lot of tricks from him, you know, and you know, and things, you know, just things to do, and watched him pretty closely. So Michael's good at stuff. You don't forget that stuff. And so I think, I think maybe you know, perhaps the council loss of a couple of years ago maybe nodded him a, a lot more, perhaps than losing for mayor. Right. And I just think he just uh, redoubled his efforts, and he was he was everywhere this time. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say I think the last time that he ran for council, uh, where he came in fifth place, uh, a lot of people had said after the fact that well they didn't see him really out there that he really wanted it. So maybe now he you know took the two years to think about it and really as you said redouble his efforts. And I want to mention that uh, there were only three thousand votes between Ayana and 
Michael. Mm -hmm. So that's, you could see him topping the ticket, which he has done before. Um, do you, th I talked to Preeti earlier on the show about whether or not Ayana, because she had such a strong finish, if she maintains those numbers, if she might run for council president in January, every January, as you know, the right. council elects a new council president. We will definitely have new councilors on the body. Not Five just new members at least, right? Exactly, yep. exactly. Um, but Michael could also come back and say, I want to be council president again. It's something he's done, uh, and he could walk yeah, in. There's and, nothing to, to stop him from doing right? that. Council Murphy has the third year, and he's term limited. Yeah. Uh, and I'm assuming, and I'm, I, I would put a pretty good bet that Council Murphy will return to the council right. once again. Uh, and he's done a nice job as council president. It's, it's funny, Council Murphy's tenure as council president uh, has been really smooth. It's been, yeah. and they've dealt with some tough issues. Redistricting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was yeah. a big issue, which uh, may end up hurting at least one city councilor currently sitting, and that's Bill Linehan. Redistricting al always has a chance of disrupting, you know, yeah. you know, the waters and things like that. So they, that will be telling what happens in November there, you know, yeah. and with no preliminary election to, uh, to base it on. Right. Uh, this is a rematch. But I, I've seen Councilor Linehan out there. I know, I know his challenger has been out there, uh, you know, running hard, but... Council on hand, I've seen uh, redoubling efforts, particularly in the South End and in, in, in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, I think Bill actually ran for the seat back years ago mm -hmm. uh, before he was successful. But he's been in the building a long time. He's built up a lot of goodwill and trust uh, in his community in South Boston. Right. And so, with that, you know, you see that you see John Conley in that part. You, you see some ways Steve Murphy does very well in Dorchester, mm -hmm. in West Roxbury, Hyde right. Park. Obviously, the vote totals from those two areas are going to be fairly significant, I would say, for yes. their two favorite sons. Yep. <laughs> Other people, uh, you know, will benefit from that, mm -hmm. like a, perhaps a Council Linehan, like yeah. a Council Murphy, like, like Michael Flaherty. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty Keogh. Mich Michelle Wu will benefit because there will be an increased turnout in Chinatown right. uh, in, in the South End. Uh, so you're going to see, uh, I think you're going to see big numbers, but other people will kind of be kind of the draft cars and, right. and benefit from that. Sometimes uh, in elections past, candidates will get what we call bullet votes. So even though they have four votes for the at-large council, they might go in and just circle one person's. Which, kind uh, of, which actually equals four votes for you. Right, exactly. Yeah. Do you think we'll see a lot of that happening this time around in November? Or because this field, I mean, truthfully, this is probably the most impressive field I've seen in a very long time. Do you think people will spread out their votes? Oh, for council? For, yeah. for at large. I think people are going to spread it out because a lot of first time candidates. There's also a kid, Jeff Ross is in that final. Right. Who I think came in sixth in the yep. race and pretty impressive first time yep. candidate has been around. Anissa Sabi George. Anissa, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think what's yeah, the bullet strategy, it's, uh, it's great to talk about it. It's, it's hard to do. <laughs> it's really hard to do. It's hard to tell somebody you have four choices but only vote for me. Right. Diehards uh, will do that. Diehards will do it. People, but. I think kind of you hear the newer voters. I think I think that's kind of a thing that's gone the way of, you know, perhaps things of the past. <laughs> old, old Boston. The old Boston. <laughs> I mean, the 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 bullet vote. You, if you try to explain that to somebody who moved into the city, oh, they have five no years, ten years. What are you talking about? Right. The bullet vote. So yeah, it's a. It's they a think tough, it's something very bad. <laughs> they think it is. Yeah, and it's. It, yeah. Uh, but so it's tough to pull that off. Right. There are some people who in this race who are good at that. Where well, they can pull that off is, uh, but it does. It's a, it's, a, it's a strategy, and if you can pull it off, it's, it's a good one to have in your toolbox. Any predictions for the mayor's race? Are you willing to, to go no. on that plank? No, it's, 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 it's fun to watch. Obviously, it, uh, I think John probably relishes the spot of being the underdog. Mm -hmm. um, Marty, I think, surprised a lot of people uh, by coming, not by coming in the final two, but you know, coming in first. Yeah. All, you know, even though the margin was you know, fairly slim, right. I would say. Um, but I, there's a whole, judging by the turnout uh, and by the sheer fact that a lot, a lot of people come out in November elections, there are a lot of votes to be had out there. Yeah. Uh, and truly a lot of undecideds. And if people couldn't, if that's the excuse, if people couldn't make their choices because they, really ch they didn't have enough to choose from, well, now those, uh, those people, now they're going to start identifying these people. Right. And it's also a, a key element of, you know, which the, the, the people who came in number, number three through 12. Yeah. And you go after every single one of them, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, which way uh, they break and which way their supporters break, mm -hmm. uh, and if they can keep them as, as a block. Right. Uh, so it's going to be a fun six weeks. Uh, the thing you fear is that, you know, I said this the other night, that you know, the mayor announced late, 
and then all kinds of things happened in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, the marathon bombings, the, yep. the Whitey Bulger trial, yep. the Aaron Hernandez stuff. Right. The Bruins went to the Stanley Cup, or the sixth game of the Stanley Cup, yep. and next thing you know it was July 4th. Right. You, just, you know, we're all excited. The Red Sox are in the I was in just going to say, now going that the Red Sox are going to the playoffs. Right. Like Freudian slip is a World Series, <laughs> but hopefully. But the more they go, the less people. people's attention, particularly since they haven't been in it for so long, uh, right. five or six years, that it's going to divert people's attention, maybe. Yeah, perhaps. and the World Series is a, a week before November 5th. Yeah. So that's going to be tough um, for people to be paying attention to. But of course, we hope that they are paying attention. Um, there are also several uh, district races. The only uh, city councilor who does not have a challenger is Frank Baker from Dorchester, District 3. Were you surprised that Frank didn't and he have... De and he deserves it after that, after that <laughs> he tussle did. he went through. He and yeah. John and, and Phil Carver had a tough race a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure uh, Frank is relishing the uh, <laughs> the break. I mean, it just... It's a, it's a, gr I mean, it's a grind. I, I, you know, I get elected in 01 finally and then had, you know, pretty competitive races in 03 and 05. And I remember 07 came around and I said, oh. yeah. But you know what? I think it also, that's, that's another thing that benefit, I think, someone like John Conley is that he's been, uh, he's been in these, ra and, and, and also Marty, who, even though he wasn't a candidate, worked in all these competitive races right. and was at, very active in them. But John, you know, you run at large every two years, you're always going to have competition, right. and it's always a dogfight, yep. but it keeps your people sharp. I noticed when I didn't have opponents in 07 and 09, people are political junkies. They want to work for somebody. Yep. You'd actually lose people. To other to, campaigns because exactly, exactly. they, they want to be active they want to be involved yeah. that's you know part of who they are so if we could only get the rest of the uh the citizens of boston to be that uh immersed and entrenched in what's going on in yeah city government. I, I hope so i you know one of our big efforts over at northeastern university is to get kids we get kids all over the world to go to the yeah. school but kids who are from the united states all of the us we encourage them you know to get active yeah. uh to, to to vote even though they may be registered in portland oregon the residents of the city while they're here, yep. have their voice heard, yep. uh, and, 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 and so many people, but I, you know, you just don't sit on the sidelines in this. Right. Uh, these, you know, the people running for mayor, uh, they're not looking for charity, but they're busting their humps out yep. there running and 20 hour days and doing their thing. It's a big job, the CEO of the city. Yeah. It's a really, really big job. You're really the CEO of of a regional economy. Exactly. Uh, so get out there and vote. Yeah, and you know, like you said, I mean, whoever is going to be the next mayor, they are responsible for our quality of life for the next four years. So you may as well get out there and get educated as to the two candidates uh, and vote on November 5th. I want to thank you, Thanks, John, Seth. for being here tonight. And of course, we will have you back um, once all this is well, said and done. Well, I am a BNN analyst I know, BNN, I know, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you even have a nice little... Uh, <laughs> Beautiful, I got my thing on the crawl. <laughs> yeah, the right. lower third. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks to all the crew behind the scenes. They always put together a great show, and I couldn't do this uh, without them, obviously. So we will see you next time. Have a good night.